Kalispera from Athens. Kalimera or happy midday in the US. Welcome and thank you all for joining us. Today we are honored to have as our guest speaker a powerful advocate for modern uh, culture in Greece. Greece's Deputy Minister of Culture and Sports, responsible for contemporary culture, Mr. Nicholas Yatromanolakis. The emphasis is on contemporary culture. Nicholas Yatromanolakis is the first Greek government official to be appointed in the in this newly established section of the Ministry of Culture and Sports. This is the ministry that is uh, uh, that is assigned with the preservation of the country's cultural heritage, promoting the arts and overseeing sports. He was recently appointed in his uh, current position in January 2011, after he had served as Secretary, uh, Secretary General of Contemporary Culture since 2019 in the same ministry. Before his involvement with politics, Nicholas has served as the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Cultural Center. He has held various positions, senior positions in Greek and multinational companies before that. Nicholas Yatromanolakis holds a, a BA in Political Science and International Relations from a Pandion School, the Pandion University in Athens and a master in public policy degree from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government in the US. He is uh, a 2013 Marshall Memorial Fellow. And in 2019, he was elected member of the board of directors of the Harvard Club of Greece. Mr. Yatomanonakis will speak to us about culture as a driver for growth an underrepresented topic, uh, but one with a huge impact, both locally and nationally, especially post-COVID. Facilitating the discussion will be our very own CYA trustee and 1991 alumna, Elaine Papoulias. Elaine is the executive director of the Center for European Studies at Harvard University, where she is responsible for the overall management and administration of the center. In the past, she has also served as the Harvard Kennedy School, as at the Harvard Kennedy School, as director of the Kokalis program on Southeastern and East Central Europe, integrating this region into the school's academic and executive education programs. In addition to her career in academia, Elaine's professional experience includes various uh, other uh, occupations, uh, advisory, uh, public affairs, communications, and analytical work for government agencies, political candidates, grassroots campaigns, nonprofit institutions, and private companies across many sectors. Thanks to Elaine and her friendship and her old acquaintance with the minister, we were able to schedule today's uh, special lecture for you. Elaine, we, we thank you for this very kind intervention. Before I pass the floor to Elaine uh, to lead the discussion, I want to uh, introduce quickly two members of CYA's academic community, uh, Athena Hadzi and Andonios Yanopoulos, who will be participate, participating in the Q&A session following uh, the minister's remarks. Uh, this is a new format we are trying out, giving a chance to our speaker to interact with uh, members of our, uh, um, our community, with our faculty. Athena Hadzi uh, holds a PhD in archaeology, uh, art history, and cultural anthropology from the University of California at Berkeley. And Antonios Yanopoulos holds a PhD in marketing, communication, and, and an MBA from the Athens University of Economics and Business. Uh, both Athena and Andonius uh, co-teach a course at CYA uh, entitled Sustainable Futures, Cultural Heritage, and Tourism Management. I'm looking forward to hearing their questions and remarks posed to the minister. 
As always, may I remind you that uh, this uh, session is going to be recorded and uh, those of you who do not want to be recorded or um, to be seen, uh, uh, please switch off your, your video cameras. Uh, Elaine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexi. Good afternoon, everyone from Boston. Uh, I am Elaine Papoulias, and as Alexi kindly introduced me, I am a proud alum, alumna of College Year in Athens and a, a CYA trustee. And it's a real pleasure today to convene the proceedings and to bring together many alumni and members of the CYA community from around the world. It's also a distinct pleasure to welcome my friend and former colleague, Nicholas Yetromanolakis, the Deputy Minister of Culture and Sports, who is responsible for contemporary culture in Greece. Before I cede the floor, I would just like to go over some administrative information. Uh, throughout the discussion, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom, Zoom screen. And uh, as soon as Mr. Yetramanolakis concludes his presentation, we'll get to as many questions as we are able. Uh, for those watching via YouTube, please submit any questions in the comments section and we'll also try to include those as well. As you know, today's, cult today's discussion will focus on culture as a driver of growth. It's a timely and important topic that all countries uh, and in particular Greece are grappling with. Um, Heritage clearly contributes, contributes to making every territory unique. And a key question that we strive to answer is how can cultural heritage help tackle contemporary urgencies in new and effective ways? A community's capacity to re-energize itself through a creative relationship with its own heritage calls for a vision, a method, and a considerable amount of ingenuity and Greece, for one, is extremely fortunate to have Nicholas Yetromanolakis spearheading these efforts. Um, I, I can say that with a, a high degree of certainty, as I have had the, the opportunity to work with Nicholas from the time he was a student at the Harvard Kennedy School and side by side as, as a colleague uh, at Harvard. So, Mr. Minister, welcome to, to CYA. And without further ado, you, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Elaine, for this very generous introduction. And thank you to the College Year of Athens uh, for hosting me uh, today. Um, uh, I hope that you find uh, this presentation interesting and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Um, I'm also gonna be sharing um, a presentation. So, uh, if you just uh, bear with me for one second, I will uh, share my screen with you. So maybe it's a bit uh, weird to discuss about culture being a driver for growth right in the middle of a pandemic and at a time where um, actually uh, culture has been severely hit around the world. Um, I mean, there have been events and shows canceled and a lot of uh, the professionals of the industry have uh, been left unemployed. Um, producers um, are actually under extreme uncertainty because they don't know if they can share, I mean, if they can plan ahead and in which conditions. Um, capacity of venues is not still um, known uh, and entire value chains of the cultural industry are in jeopardy. So for, for example, the entire movie business model uh, is forced to change uh, since movie theaters have been um, shut down. So, um, and maybe, I mean, last year you, you saw some of these headlines, um, you know, major events were canceled throughout the world, uh, major festivals were canceled, still um, a lot of um, of events are, and a lot of cultural venues are not operating um, around the world. In Greece, there was a brief window in the summer and early fall uh, when culture reopened. Uh, then we had, in November, we had to shut it down again and um, it's still closed, uh, the sector is closed. Hopefully we'll, um, 
right after Greek Orthodox Easter, we will start reopening it gradually. Um, so why on earth am I talking about culture being a driver of growth? Um, well, this um, pandemic has, as I said before, hit the cultural industry around the world uh, severely, but it also forced us to actually face systemic issues that the industry has been facing for a long time. And it kind of forced us to leapfrog towards alternative models. We needed to very quickly identify new revenue streams and we needed to identify employment opportunities and to figure new ways of connecting with the public. Obviously, in addition to these, um, all, of the, all of the states, all of the countries, they had to also kind of figure out ways to support um, uh, in, and produce immediate measures of relief for the um, cultural industry professionals. Um, I'm not going to be getting into these right now so that we focus on the growth aspect, but um, um, just to give you a brief overview, over 300 million um, euros have been um, distributed to the sector um, in Greece um, uh, in the form of support measures in that respect. So the need was to keep culture alive. And um, in order to do so, and in order to do so in the long run, and not just, um, you know, uh, short term, just, just to, to support um, the industry throughout this difficult time of the pandemic, um, we came up with this strategy, which I'm sharing uh, with you. And it has two parts. One has to do with how to improve the capacity of the sector. And the other one has to do with growth and how to empower the growth of the sector. So the right part, labor, education, skill building and intellectual property um, it has to do with improving capacity. And let's say, let me put it like building the groundwork. And then um, the, the other part of this hexagon. So, um, you know, access to funding, culture-centric local economies and audience development has to do with the sector, with, with growing the sector further. Um, so I'm going to go through the first part really quickly so we can focus on the growth. So labor issues. So that I give you some context. In Greece, we have unfortunately and traditionally um, a quite sizable undeclared economy almost around a quarter of the, of the GDP is actually comes from undeclared economy. And this is uh, very closely linked to the fact that um, there is a, a high level of um, um, micro and small enterprises. And also it has to do with the fact that um, um, the cultural sector, I mean, this is even more prevalent in the cultural sector because um, traditionally, yeah, we're talking about a lot of self-employed people and a lot of uh, micro enterprises. It's very interesting to note that we did some digging and we figured out that uh, between 2012 and 2009, because of the economic crisis that preceded the pandemic, approximately 18,000 cultural self-employed professionals closed their books, closed. So, so they, uh, that, well, that means essentially that they went off the grid in a way um, and then the pandemic struck. And that meant that these people that were off the grid um, could not benefit from the measures that we, um, you know, that the government uh, offered um, to, uh, to, the, to the sector. Uh, and a lot of them had no access to other forms of support. So we had to form an ad hoc registry where with a minimum of let's say uh prerequisites people could could sign up so that they could have access to some form of support but the thing is you know the question is what we do to i mean this is a systemic issue undeclared economy and it affects growth it affects jobs it affects um um, uh, the society, a society at large. So we, we, I mean, this was a, you know, band aid um, response, an immediate response that we had to come up with to tackle, you know, the, the crisis at hand. But what about long term? 
issues. So we are now setting up a, a simplified, let's say one-stop shop platform for cultural professionals so that they can address their tax and labor and social security issues. And at the same time, most importantly, we are now building up a system where, where we're providing incentives to self-employed professionals to come back to the grid and re-enter the formal economy within the next year. So um, we are now setting up together with the Ministry of Economy and the Ministry of Labor, a system through which we, um, uh, we will incentivize people to uh, come back to for the formal economy. Uh, in terms of intellectual property, intellectual property is, as you can understand, very, very key um, in the cultural sector um, because um, pretty much everything produced in the arts uh, is related to intellectual property. So we passed two um, intellectual property related bills within six months. One had, had to do with dynamic blocking injunction and the other one with live blocking injunction. They have to do with piracy and committing piracy. And also because of the pandemic, we knew that a lot of people would, would you know, have access to live streaming and would, you know, and, and shows on demand. So we ensured and, uh, that, that, you know, all IP related uh, rights would be um, would be paid and would be covered so that there will be no uh, breach. And the other thing we're doing now is to reinform all its mechanisms to combat piracy and upgrade the capacity of the state to actually monitor what's going on and to and to carry out you know um, this mandate. Um, a key other issue was and remains education and skill building. Actually, the pandemic has shown us that. Um, there is a need to uh, kind of like upskill um, the professionals of, of the sector, especially in terms of how they can take advantage and utilize, um, you know, technology and the capabilities that digital, um, I mean, the digital capabilities that are available out there, but also in terms of leadership, in terms of business um, uh, and professional upskilling, and also fundraising, marketing, and all these skills. At the same time, uh, there have been some systemic issues that have to do with it, with the tertiary cultural education that we're tackling with. We are revamping the curricula of, of these um, institutions, but at the same time, we're setting up a new National School of Audiovisual Arts because um, this is also closely linked to a broader strategy to encourage um, film production uh, in Greece, both from Greek um, studios, but also um, to uh, encourage also foreign studios to um, come and film in Greece. But um, with the setup of this National School of Audiovisual Arts, we will also be able to provide them with uh, better trained crews, national Greek crews, that can be um, involved in this um, in this uh, um, process, I, and this, of course, access to funding is is instrumental in this. Um, in addition to you know the national uh, measures and the national, I mean, and the, and this state budget that we have, um, uh, which has been actually declining throughout the years because of the crisis and has been quite low in the past years. Um, we were able to secure a significant amount, namely over half a billion euros um, for the Ministry of Culture through the European Union's Resilience and Recovery Fund, which is the fund that was set up to co combat, I mean, to you know, support the member states of the EU uh, throughout the pandemic. And the important thing is that half of this amount, so uh, over a quarter of, quarter of a billion, uh, has been earmarked um, for contemporary culture. And usually uh, the balance between um, the um, heritage and contemporary culture has not been half and half. And that is understandable to, to an extent in Greece because it also has to do with how you maintain uh, um, all these um, wonderful uh, monuments uh, and archeological sites and how you uh, also improve their infrastructure and so forth. So um, securing this amount for contemporary culture has been instrumental. And a lot of the things I, I talked about and a lot of the things I will talk about are linked to this. And also, in addition to that, we are also working for the first time 
towards offering a guarantee facility framework for the sector. That means that providing easier access to private funds for to the sector. Um, a lot of times, um, financial institutions and the cultural sector are are not able to, to, to understand each other and to speak the same language and would try to be like the interpreter between the two and to encourage financial institutions to actually provide funding to the cultural sector. Um, and now let's go to the other, to the, to the let's say more juicy parts of, of what I wanted to talk to you about today, which have to do with audience development and with um, the, developing this growth ecosystems that are based on culture. So audience development has to do with how you reach out to new audiences, both in Greece and outside Greece, and also to make sure that culture, which is a public good, is accessible to all citizens. And also, finally, how to increase cultural exports. So the pandemic, again, kind of forced us to um, do this leapfrogging that I mentioned earlier in terms of audience development, because the entire model of how culture was being is being accessed was forced to change because of the pandemic. So we had to be really agile and like very fast on our toes and to figure out things throughout and during the pandemic on how to change things. So we, but at the same time, this enabled us to experiment with things. So I'll give you some quick examples of things we've done during, um, in the past year um, of how we did that. So one example is the Thessaloniki Documentary uh, Festival. It was scheduled uh, to, to take place physically in the city of Thessaloniki. Um, and then really quickly, we had to, to come up with an alternative. So this, um, the, you know, it, it took a, a it took an online uh, shape, but I mean this is not very original. A lot of festivals had to do that, and and this is what they've done. The difference here is that um, we funded the festival, and um, th we agreed with the festival for the festival to commission documentary films on the pandemic, during the pandemic. So what happened was that it was not just that the festival, you know, changed and became, you know, from physical, it became digital, but the topic also changed and the, um, you know, it became very topical, focusing on the pandemic itself to the extent that it actually, you know, made international headlines. For This is, for example, what I'm sharing with you was an article in the New York Times about it, which is, about exactly how during the pandemic, this festival invited filmmakers around the world to make short movies about the lockdown. Um, another example is, it has to do with, um, with the uh, very well known, at least to um, those uh, that you know, are familiar with Greece, the very well known uh, Athens and Epidaurus festival, which is a staple of the Greek summer for decades now. Um, ancient Greek drama performances and other kind of performances in the summer, both in Athens and the ancient theater of Epidaurus. Um, we were able to have a, a shorter, tighter version of the festival during the summer, but with limited capacity. And um, we felt that this would also could also be an opportunity to experiment and to try to, to, to do something new. Um, what we did was that um, we created this new model called Live from Epidaurus. And for the first time ever in the history of um, this theater, we broadcasted live uh, an ancient Greek drama to people outside Greece. So essentially, um, we offered for free on a donation basis, this um, show this performance, it was actually the Persians, um, to a, a global audience. And we did it, um, you know, and, and the impact was actually more than we 
uh, we we ever expected that it would be. So uh, just I'm sharing a few of the articles that were reading uh, were written. Um, so this is the international version of Time Out, and then this is, for example, the New York Times, which actually did a review of the play that people uh, ha had access to online. Um, I have to say that 100,000 100, people uh, watched uh, for at least a minute the, this um, uh, play online outside Greece. Um, and actually the donations were uh, that, we, that the festival and the play received were enough so that to cover the expenses of the live streaming. Um, this is another review by, um, uh, on The Guardian uh, in the UK. And this is very interesting. This is an article from the Financial Times which used this example of live from Epidaurus to um, discuss, um, you know, the future of of live um, of, of of live theater and live performances, and um, it, it, it they used uh, what we did in Epidaurus as an example and as a case study on how one could actually uh, work around the issues created by the pandemic. Um, another thing that we're working on, on audience development is actually this, um, which I'm sharing right now. And actually this will launch within the next um, couple of weeks. It's actually a revival of, um, of a project that used to run um, by the Ministry of uh, Culture that has to do with um, uh, providing um, grants for the translation of Greek literature books. And it's uh, actually something that um, stopped happening for, for almost a decade. We are reintroducing it and revamping it. And um, um, we are actually going to be providing both grants to foreign publishing houses uh, to translate Greek books, but also grants to um, Greek publishing houses to translate excerpts of books, just segments, small segments of the books, so that they can increase the, um, uh, you know, the sellability of the book in the foreign market. Um, we are also revamping the, 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 the presence of um, Greece in, you know, in global uh, book fairs, but also in other uh, sectors of uh, uh, the cultural industry um, within this um, concept. So we're going to be very, very much focusing on audience development, both in Greece and abroad uh, in, the, in the years to come. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to focus on is what I um, was also part of the discussion and the description of this lecture, which had, which had to do with this cultural-centric local economies. The truth of the matter is that culture can be um, can provide a sustainable um, model for the growth of local economies of local uh, and and around culture you can have different uh, other components and other sectors building and growing such as tourism and education and the agri and food industry and retail and what we are now designing is I mean this is this whole thing is based on this concept also of creative placemaking. If you don't know what creative placemaking is, this is actually a term that was developed in like around 10 years ago by the National Endowment for the Arts in the US. Where we, and it's, it's a concept that's constantly evolving since. Um, the idea is that you have partners from the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and the communities, the local communities, coming in together to um, actually um, shaping the character of, of it can be a neighborhood, it can be an entire city, it can be an entire region, uh, shaping it around arts and culture. And, um, and so that means that culture and the creative economy are becoming a part of the economy of that region, of uh, they can create jobs, they can create long-term benefits. And um, it can also pr provide uh, you know, and rejuvenate, provide, let's say, opportunities to rejuvenate uh, entire regions uh, and improve um, the quality of life in these uh, areas. Um, so what we're doing right now is actually we're developing 
in the within the premises of the recovery and, resili and resilience fund uh, that I mentioned earlier, pilot ecosystems, and we are focusing on areas of Greece that are actually, um, you know, that they have they have suffered um, through high unemployment, deindustrialization, and other social um, and financial hardships. Um, namely Eastern Macedonian Thrace, so the regions of uh, Kavala, Drama, Xanthi, Rhodopi, and Evros, for those of you that are familiar, and also um, the Eastern Aegean islands. Uh, so for example, Chios, Samos, Limnos, Ikaria, Kos, and so on, Leros, and so on and so forth. Um, so there we are gonna be um, linking together all different levels of government, so local, regional, national, and we're gonna create um, economic master plan, cultural economic master plans that will uh, help us create strategies in these areas, connecting the dots between dispersed and different um, cultural existing cultural activities, and also fostering new cultural activities, um, improving existing cultural infrastructure, creating new cultural infrastructure where, whenever it's needed, and um, focusing on what is called um, the experience economy, offering different cultural experiences, but not only cultural experiences per se, but a broader set of experiences um, in these areas uh, to actually um, reinvigorate them and uh, create jobs and opportunities in, this, um, in these uh, regions. Um, the other thing we're doing with, and is, this is also linked a bit to that context is we are revisiting the, you know, the plethora of monuments and sites we have around Greece, and we are re, let's say, reutilizing re them, respecting their character, respecting their heritage and, and history, but also offering a new reading of them, if I may say. Um, so for this photo here is an example. This is from a, 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 an actual a soundscape that the National Museum of Contemporary Art created in the Roman Agora in Athens uh, last summer, um, hence the speaker. Um, this is another example. Um, this is a, a, um, the uh, show of uh, the Dionysus Cavalleratos, and this is at the Herod Atticus Audion again in Athens. And this is actually an example where we're not just, you know, using um, cultural I mean, venues and monuments and sites for um, just performances, you know, like a, like a recital, for example. But we're trying to blend together, as you can see, um, contemporary culture with uh, uh, cultural heritage and create through this, uh, I mean, through this project, uh, in new ways of seeing uh, these monuments, but also uh, creating a dialogue between the contemporary cultural production and the um, uh, and, and you know our rich cultural heritage. This is an example from a two two years ago. So this is not this didn't happen last year during the pandemic. This is a bit uh, before that. This happened in um, I think 2019, and is it's this is a, a sculpture by Anthony Gromley, and it was and and this was an installation that took place in, on the island of Delos of Delos, and you you see again this dialogue between contemporary culture and heritage, and it is true that when you have you know such a wealth in uh, like Greece has in terms of of heritage. Um, it is it is kind of like unavoidable that sometimes this wealth uh, can can also act as a deterrent of focusing on contemporary heritage or uh, contemporary cultural production and on the sector which is actually um, you know functioning right now. But th and this is why we have been very very um, in, um, you know we've been focusing a lot on uh, uh, on explaining and showcasing that you know the uh, one should not and doesn't have to you know be pitched against the other but they actually they can coexist to a great extent um another thing is um exploring 
alternative business models for cultural institutions. And I'll give you two quick examples. One has to do with art and prescription. This is actually something that was done on a pilot basis from certain museums, mostly museums. Um, but now we actually have agreed to also with the Ministry of Health to, um, to expand it to a full scale program. Um, art on prescription essentially me is something that um, a few countries are doing already, for example, the UK, and um, it's focusing mostly on mental health. But uh, what it means essentially is that um, cultural professionals and healthcare professionals are both trained so that healthcare professionals can prescribe art activities. They can vary from just a simple visit to a museum to more immersive experiences. Um, so they can prescribe the, these to their patients. And on the other hand, cultural professionals are able to execute these programs um, and also they can develop projects that can create also an alternative revenue stream for cultural institutions. Another uh, focus that we are having, um, that we're, you know, they're, they're, I mean, another area where we're focusing on is silver tourism. Silver tourism uh, is um, uh, another way of saying tourism for people that are over the age of 65. Why focus there? A, because this is the highest and fastest growing segment of tourism right now worldwide. B, because people over 65, they become, as years go by, they become healthier, they have disposable income and they have time. But at the same time, they have other interests than just the general population. So in order to attract um, this segment of the population, uh, you have to uh, adjust your offerings to accommodate them. So to give you an example, um, I, I mean, this has to do both with infrastructure and with programs that are being uh, offered. So um, to give you an example um, is, um, uh, it's, um, uh, for example, uh, you have Olympia, the, the site of Olympia, the archaeological site of Olympia. And the site of Olympia is very close to a port where um, cruise ships are docking. And cruise ships, you know, that's people over 65, they are one of the main target groups of, uh, of cruise ships, but they cannot necessarily, they don't have the time. And also they, sometimes they cannot physically, you know, roam through the entire site of Olympia. So improving the infra infrastructure there to do so is an example of that. Or to talk about contemporary culture, um, creating new uh, programs and digital um, enhancements of let's say in the National Gallery or in the National Museum of Contemporary Arts, or uh, having specific offerings, for example, by the um, National Theater of Greece uh, that can be also in other languages, it's an example of how one can reach out to these audiences, including things like, I mean, and having like subtitling and overtitling, for example, in plays and operas and other offer cultural offerings uh, it's it's a, in a, it's an example and a quick win uh, to actually attract new segments and in, uh, let's say grow the uh, target audience of um, of the cultural industry. Um, and another one, and by that I will I will close this so that I can receive your questions. Another example is craft. Craft has been identified internationally as a, a great. Um, you know, it's coming a big comeback. It can, um, it's, it's something that can be very, um, uh, I mean, it can reinvigorate ent entire communities. Um, Greece has a lot of different areas focusing on a lot of different um, aspects of craft from um, weaving to ceramics and from, you know, uh, jewelry to um, silk, uh, making um, you we have a, a again a wealth that has been largely untapped so that's the strategy here that we have already kicked off is to map the sector identify 
the, U, the unique selling proposition of different Greek regions link craft to contemporary um, creative um, segments such as design or fashion um, and care, provide accredited um, training to craftspeople, um, encourage the sourcing of local materials um, to be used. So for example, local Greek silk or Greek uh, clay and so on and so forth and provide incentives in that area. And also um, provide the necessary training and the necessary infrastructure and tools so that craftspeople can also um, export their work and um, you know, uh, promote uh, Greek um, design, it, whether we're talking about traditional design or contemporary design. Um, what I touched upon very briefly is it's just, you know, there are just segments and components of a greater and broader strategy. And uh, just closing, I would like to say that um, these are just parts of a broader strategy that we are, we've already, we were already designing, but um, the pandemic has actually forced us to expedite things and also to, to be more quick in our responses and, and also a bit more uh, risk taking. And I think this is a great learning for everyone. And um, the other thing is that uh, the pandemic has proven that culture can be a safe haven for a lot of people. A lot of people turned to culture as a relief during this very stressful time. And it showcased the potential that the industry has. Uh, so it was very important to us to make sure that um, this potential can be actually maximized um, and that we can also support the sector at the same time. So thank you for your attention. I'm, I'm open to your questions and to have, you know, to further this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing these, these complex and fascinating uh, plans. Um, I have many questions, but as we're closing in on time, um, I will I will save them for the end if, if we do have time. But first, I'd like to call upon two members of uh, the faculty of CYA, Athena Hadzi and Antonios Yanopoulos, who teach um, quite a relevant course at CYA called Sustainable Futures, Cultural Heritage and Tourism Management. Mm -hmm. um, Athena and Antonio, the floor is yours. And Donitz, maybe you can begin. Okay, thank you very much for having me. I feel honored and privileged to address such a distinguished audience today, the broader uh, CYA community. Uh, dear Deputy Minister, uh, further to your inspiring conversation regarding audience development and cultural settings, local economies, among others, uh, allow me to put some emphasis on the connection between culture and tourism. Also asking your feedback on the potential impact of current tourist trends and the implications of, uh, I'd say, neolocalism on contemporary culture. So to be more specific, um, the tourism industry is like a mirror. What it offers often reflects the trends that we see in society more broadly. Sharing economy and Airbnb related activities have changed the way that um, tourists immerse in these nations and the sorts of experience they co-create with other stakeholders in the tourism ecosystem, as we usually say. And it is often said that they create a sense of place and engagement with the community, stimulating this trend of neolocalism. There are also some counter arguments mm -hmm. uh, posting that in that way, tourists intrude into the local lifestyle, distorting its texture. Uh, since our considerations today go beyond the natural environment and pertain to the destination's culture and social landscape as well, what would be your valuable input on how these new forms of travel that support the concept of neolocalism may impact the culture identity of a place, a uh, city origination of Greece. So how and if possible can we tackle view this issue from a cultural perspective, maybe? Well, I think that, first of all, I mean, uh, I, I think what is important here in terms of uh, the regional development is that one focus focuses on, let's say, the, the competitive advantages that one has. I think we went through a trend where everyone was trying to kind of like replicate the other and to, you know, and that kind of led to, to um, 
kind of like the westernization with the worst possible definition of of the term uh, of a lot of experiences because they a lot of people felt that this is what um, people wanted. And um, also that uh, I think had a negative impact because it kind of, um, a, lot of a lot of local elements were kind of lost in this pro throughout this process. Now, as you said, we're, we're facing a, an opposite trend. Um, and I, I think though that um, these things cannot be and should not be like mutually exclusive. Like you, you can you can focus on 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 your locality, and there and we, we also saw how the pandemic forced us, forced all of us to focus on our locality because essentially we didn't have a choice. I mean, we could not travel, we could not do anything else. But I think that you know preserving elements of that and showcasing them, and also um, for example, craft has seen a revival because of that. A lot of people claim that, you know, the pandemic has actually forced craft because of that. And all, but, but at the same time, I feel that as we're gonna be, um, let's say, stepping into this meta or post COVID or, you know, neo, I don't know, COVID era, um, I think we will see that a lot of these things will, you know, will be able to be, to be combined together without, without, let's say, pitting one against the other. I feel that this experience has, um, has changed not only what is happening from you know, the cultural organization, but also the attitude and viewpoint of both you know, um, the locals, but also the visitors of these areas. And I think we will see this as a trend in the, uh, in the, you know, in the, uh, in the uh, near future. Thank you so much for that. So maybe a, a sort of a balance or equilibrium in uh, the broader ecosystem, something I, like that. I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, of, of, of finding a balance and, you know, not going to, e e you know, either extreme. Yeah. Athena? Um, Mr. Deputy Minister, this was a sweeping lecture and I was coming up with questions and then your next slide would answer all of them and I was particularly delighted to hear the news about books. Um, but uh, I will focus on uh, museums and uh, the two uh, challenges as um, heritage experts and museum professionals see them in the 21st century, inclusivity and diversity, and especially um, on contemporary art and the glorious National Museum of Contemporary Art that mm -hmm. um, started very strongly, finally inaugurated, congratulations, yeah, unfortunately closed down. And uh, I think it's um, growth potential. It is mm -hmm. very strong, a very solid collection and um, an extrovert character from the beginning. So since we're all um, anxiously wait for the museums to reopen again, what are the plans for the growth of the National Museum with um, attention to inclusivity and uh, diversity? Thank you for this question. Actually, I mean, this was a uh, one of my the main pro the, the the opening and the daily let's say operation of the National Museum of Contemporary Art was actually one of my, you know, main projects uh, while I was the Secretary General of Contemporary Art. Um, as you said, it was unfortunate that we uh, we um, we opened it uh, just two weeks before the pandemic struck, and so then we had to close it. We reopened it again in um, late in the late summer or early summer and then we had also we, we managed to even squeeze in two temporary two temporary exhibitions um and then we had to close it again in november hopefully it will reopen in may all museums will reopen in may that's the plan that we are aiming at uh, now regarding your question um i think that the let's say that this this museum has been almost like a like a missing piece of the jigsaw of Athens because um, it I think it will help to balance again as we said before the equilibrium uh, between um, the past and the present of, of the city and uh, I think it can that it can do this in a very very effective way both through its uh, permanent collection, but also I think 
um, by, I, I think it has the opportunity to actually embody what the, the modern role that museums have that goes beyond just preserving and showcasing their collection. They have a, a very key include, you know, role in, in terms of educating people, um, including people, making people feel welcome, and um, also opening a, a broader discussion across a, 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 a range of, of topics. And um, I also, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to, to, to tell you, I'm giving you a sneak preview that uh, we, within the next couple of weeks, we will also announce the appointment of a new um, director uh, in the museum, which we feel that will be this person, this particular person will be able to lead the museum in, in, you know, in, in the years to come and to be able to, um, to actually uh, provide um, the tools uh, necessary for the museum to, to, to uh, implement its role. In terms of diversity, um, I've already we have been discussing, not through just through this museum, but throughout also all of the funding programs that we have as, as the Ministry of Culture, uh, we, we have already set up a series of guidelines and we said that you know, all of these programs should encourage diversity in terms of um, in, you know, uh, gender, sexual orientation, um, religion, ethnicity, uh, disability, um, age, and so on and so forth. Um, we embodied that also in the contemporary museum and the Museum of Contemporary Art by hosting um, Ubuntu, which is actually an uh, it was it's a show that is showcasing um, contemporary African and African American art, and um, this was not a coincidence. It was done by choice because again we wanted to showcase that this museum will have an important role to play um, in. Uh, highlighting the cultural diversity of the city itself. Very nice, thank you so much. This was a fantastic show and I hope it's still on when the museum reopens in May, everybody must see it. And thank you very much for sharing the news uh, about the new director. I look forward to that, thank you. Thank you, Athena. Um, I'd like to turn now to some questions from the audience and mm -hmm. uh, picking up on the topic of, of inclusivity. We do have a question um, that's linked to inclusivity and sil silver tourism, but which focuses on travelers with disabilities. And mm -hmm. the question specifically is, um, can we hope to see an improvement um, on focusing on supporting disability, travelers with disabilities to visit Greece? Um, and will that be re reflected specifically in the ministry's uh, website? Thank you for that question. Um, yes, um, the, 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 the good news are that uh, since last year, actually, uh, yeah, last year, the government uh, has been uh, working on a national strategy on, on disability and to support people with disabilities and every and single ministry, so every segment, let's say, of the government has to provide its own plans and strategy on that. So we have been actually working on that for quite a while now. And this also links to silver tourism because we, there are also infrastructure that will be funded through the RRF that will benefit not just the silver tourism um, uh, visitors, but also visitors uh, of cultural sites with disabilities. So for example, um, what we're trying to do is, first of all, make sure that all Physical, I mean, first of all, you have a lot of different, um, let's say, um, different disabilities. So this is not just like one, um, it doesn't have a, only have to do with, for example, with people that have uh, problems with, uh, um, I mean, rotary skills, or for example, walking or people that are in wheelchairs. You have visually impaired people, you have people with hearing uh, problems and um, we, we have to make sure that we include everyone and that we have a strategy that will be able to accommodate most of them. What we're doing so far is, first of all, making sure that um, if not all, most of our sites and monuments and museums are 
accessible to people, uh, for example, that have um, that uh, the people with disabilities, for example, ramps are being into play are, are being installed. Um, other, uh, you know, handrails. Um, we have uh, we are printing a lot of catalogs in um, the Braille system. Uh, we are designing new guides for the visually impaired that are audio guides. Um, we also have in some cases, both in contemporary art museums and in um, um, heritage museums, we have uh, exhibits that are tactile so that people can actually touch them. And, and people with visual impairments, for example, they can touch them and they can um, experience that. Um, also, uh, the National Museum of Contemporary Art has spearheaded a very, um, a, a very pioneering project uh, that has to do with people that are in the spectrum of autism. And because, you know, that is also, mental health is also a component of disability as, as chronic illnesses are. And uh, so, you know, people in the spectrum of autism, sometimes they need special conditions to visit a place. So for example, they don't, they need um, a substitute lighting, they need, uh, they don't, they don't appreciate loud noises and so on. So they have special times where the museum is open just for them. So they can experience this without any other distractions. Um, so this is something we're, we're focusing on and uh, there have been things done already. We need to do more, we will do more. And um, we, um, we, we have to make sure that the entire chain is, let's say, for people with disabilities, it, it's, it's taken care of. So that means how to get somewhere. So that means transportation and then the accommodation of these people. So hotels, um, where, um, and then how to visit cultural sites, um, how to, you know, the entire experience has to be catered. And, and, and we have to make sure that um, everything is kind of like uh, linked to one another. And the, uh, I noted uh, the comment on the website of the ministry. Um, we, uh, and, uh, we, we're gonna redesign the entire site. So the new site hope, uh, will adhere to the international standards that are, in, you know, that are exist for people with disabilities so that it can be fully accessible. I'll try to synthesize a, a few questions since we're pretty much uh, run out of time. And um, may I suggest that perhaps we, we can collect the questions that we don't get to and, um, and get some answers back to, to those people that post them yeah. after, after the event. Um, there seems to be some discussion um, and concern about respecting culture as we think about sort of pivoting and, um, and reinterpreting culture and specifically, um, are there institutional and legal frameworks in place that can um, ensure that monuments and sites um, and the environment for that matter um, are, are not abused? Yes, I mean, these, these exist for a long time now. Uh, it, um, I mean, I think two of the most powerful institutions in the country are the, um, the Central Archaeological um, Council and the Cent uh, Central Council for um, uh, Monuments. Uh, these are, I mean, any kind of intervention, let's say, or even not just intervention, but e any kind of even, you know, use, even for something that the, the Ministry of Culture itself wants to do, the Ministry of Culture itself wants to do, in, in, in such a monument or location or site, it has to get the approval of, of um, this council. So uh, there are checks and balances in this process. Um, all studies have to get approved by, by this council. And um, actually, uh, as people that live in Greece know, this council um, even, you know, has to give the green light before, uh, before even, uh, you know, a private citizen can build their house or, you know, uh, dig in their plot or do anything. So, so there are these very, very strict and rightly so, I mean, strict institutions that make sure and ensure that, um, you know, uh, our monuments are protected. If I may close with a question um, that it's a, a little bit more self-reflective. Um, mm -hmm. You, it is hard to believe that, that 
it is only now that we have uh, a first time, uh, for the first time, a deputy minister of contemporary culture. Um, your, your plans are quite ambitious and bold and, and exciting. Um, but I would, I would wonder um, how big this challenge is. You, the ministry is, is quite a large ministry. It has uh, over 5,000 uh, people that are part of the ministry. Uh, but those working on contemporary culture are a small fraction um, of that, that total number. Um, as you think sort of 10 years into the future, what will you hope will have been the legacy of the first uh, assistant minister of contemporary culture? What do you hope that you will lay the groundwork for and, and achieve? Well, you know, I, I was sworn in during the pandemic. So that kind of like pivoted necessarily, you know, unavoidably the entire, you know, discussion and the entire strategy. But as I said, it also gave us an opportunity to, to kind of, um, do things that maybe other uh, under other circumstances wouldn't have been possible. What I would like to have, I mean, for it to happen is first of all, to make sure that um, we have a resilient uh, sector, cultural sector mm -hmm. um, of professionals that can actually be, uh, they can, they will be able to sustain themselves through their work. Um, I think that this is important and this is kind of like um, the prerequisite for everything else. Um, and um, I, I would like people to understand and um, appreciate um, the cultural production of Greece in its entirety, which means um, obviously our very, very, very rich heritage uh, against which I would never try to compete. And that's not the point, competing. You don't have to compete against it, but you can complement it and you can augment it. And um, this is part of my mandate. And this is what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. We wish you the best of luck in all of these endeavors. And I want to thank you, Mr. Yetromanolakis, for your time today and being so candid with your plans and, and the challenges and the opportunities um, that stand before us. I want to thank Andoni and Athena and all of you who have tuned in today. Um, and I hope this is just the beginning of a discussion that we might be able to con continue and check in with you and, and see how we're progressing um, along this continuum and with these goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.